Welcome to Washington Policy Center's uh, Washington Policy on the Go. My name is David Bowes. I'm the Communications and Marketing Director for Washington Policy Center. But we're going to start with Leave since uh, she's in the high-tech new, brand new WPC studio, and you see that excellent uh, camera there with the with the backdrop. Leave, let's let's start uh, by talking about Seattle because Seattle announced made this big announcement that they're going to have to uh, close 20 elementary schools. As a parent of uh, elementary school age children or primary school age children myself, I I was very empathetic to the parents who are suddenly faced with this um, cross town dilemma of moving their kids, radically shifting where they would go, and the chaos that that could bring to families. And uh, it looks like you know I was not alone. The um, school district had meetings where they had packed houses of parents uh, concerned about this issue. You. Uh, the, the, while at the meeting, the district uh, superintendent made a statement, a challenge. He said, basically, hey, if somebody else has a better idea than closing schools, I want to hear it. And, um, you know, as a research director, I can imagine you heard that and said, OK, you know, <laughs> challenge accepted. So yeah. let's 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 take a look at whether or not Seattle has to has to close schools. But let's start with the structural problem that you that you addressed in your blog, which is you know, what is it about a superintendent or why is it that a superintendent and, or other management, and Seattle's not alone in this, but one of the reactions when faced with a challenge is immediately the, the school closure or the chastising of parents that they don't have enough money, that somehow it's it's not something on their side of the, of the aisle that needs to happen, but it's something that the community or parents have let them down on. Why is that? What's the structural flaw that you see? Well, the structural flaw in the system of public education is that parents have no power to prevent a powerful central bureaucracy from closing their schools. They have no power. And you can see articles about this online right now. Laurel Hurst Elementary supporters are concerned and they're sending around petitions. Please, they're begging the central district authorities to not close their schools. There's So there's petitions being circulated around Seattle now. Don't, please don't close our schools. That's the structural problem. Problem is they have no option. They can't take their money with them to a private school because we, we are in Washington state, what is considered a school choice desert. We do not allow parents to take their money out of the public system into a private system because we don't have school choice here because of the power of the union. So what really struck me about the challenge that this that this Seattle Public School Superintendent issued uh, we, uh, was that he's lying. He's lying about his budget. He says we have to do more with less. That's a lie. The public schools in Seattle receive have a budget annual budget of 1.17 billion dollars that's $23,500 per student in Seattle it is the wealthiest district in the entire state and if you just look at the budget which is actually easy to read on their website it's one of the unusually transparent budgets of school districts in the state you can go and and search for it on their website. You can search for it on Google. And I have it right here in my hand. And, and what that budget shows is that the district, the central offices, employ a, a, about a third of all the employees in the public schools in Seattle. The central offices spend over $500 million of the $1.17 billion budget. And that's obviously the place where you would cut first before you close one elementary school for children. That's obvious. Yeah, but I found that I found that number shocking myself because you know when you say a one point one one point one seven billion dollar but overall budget, and then you find out that you know roughly six hundred thirty million is going to you know straight to staffing the schools, and the rest is administrative costs. It, it, you know, you start to think, well, wait a second. It's not like every child is an employee, you know, where they're managing that many employees. It's there's a basic service level there. Um, it's I mean, it's a shocking number, I think, to to hear. It's not even close. It's not 500 million and some change. It's, it's like 538 million dollars. It's crazy. It's 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 really shocking. It's It's shocking that this is not a scandal. OK, <laughs> that, nice. that no one speaks up against the schools because there's some kind of sacred cow in in our culture. And but the children who are being the people who are being sacrificed are the children of Seattle to meet, you know, to hire 
adults in the system. It's become a jobs program. It's clear as day that this is what's happened. The, the, these administrators are paying themselves very high salaries and basically playing a political game and lying to the public that they don't have enough money. And this is all part of a kabuki dance to position themselves uh, in anticipation of the coming legislative session, well, they'll where, where they will claim that they are underfunded, they have they are short one hundred million dollars, they have to close the schools, and so they rile up the community uh, to create a political uh, pressure on the state legislature to give the Seattle public schools more money, which is in just an outrage. It is the most most wealthy district in the entire state. It is grossly mismanaged. It has driven, it is now, so, so there are three general areas for saving these 20 Seattle elementary schools from closure. First, it's cutting central office spending, which should be easy to do. They're spending $500 million, cutting 20% of that section of spending would save $100 million, which they claim they need. That's one way to approach this. Another way to approach this is to renegotiate the co the contracts that that these district administrators negotiated as recently as 2022. They overpaid in these contracts. Well, they can reopen them, declare an emergency. Let's renegotiate and get a more reasonable contract. And number three, they could end their their policy of basically chasing families out of Seattle public schools. The whole recent uh, focus on race is outraging parents. And that's why 4,300, that's why the families of 4,300 students have pulled their kids out of Seattle public schools. And with them, I figured this out from the state funding portion. It's it, That represents about $62 million that the district has lost because of the policies. So, so you know, you don't hear the school district saying, what can we do to get the families to come back to our schools? No, they're trying to, they're, they're in political gamesmanship here, threatening the closure of schools to get more money for themselves. The money goes first to themselves and then to the schools. And it's it should be a scandal. Uh, and, uh, you know, I invite people to look, this, this, not, this is not rocket science. If, if you just keep in mind, do not be intimidated by these by these budgets. Eighty two percent of spending in the public schools is spent on the salaries of benefits of employees. So, like any small business that is in the service industry, it's the salaries of employees that take up the most of the budget. So, where does the money go? It's in in the pay you give to the employees and the number of employees that you hire. Now, all the research shows, and this is true in Seattle public schools and across the country, that the schools in, in, in have taken the recent increases in spending uh, and hired non-teachers at triple the rate of hiring teachers. So this is what's happening. It's it's not serving the education needs of children. So the other point here is not to not forget in the last five years, Seattle public schools has received an increase of $6,000 per student. So for the superintendent of Seattle Public Schools to paint a picture of want and poverty and dire need is just a, a flat out blatant lie. Well, and you pointed out that um, there has been um, ample evidence that the uh, that the district negotiated a bad deal with the unions that they knew they wouldn't be able to uh, they wouldn't be able to keep. Seattle Times did fine reporting on this um, and, yes. and made it clear that, hey, you know what, they knew that they wouldn't be able to keep this up, but they made the deal anyway. So now to act shocked, shocked to find out that they can't make the, pay the payments <laughs> is a dishonest <laughs> approach toward it. Well, you yes. know, I'd be like negotiating with a contractor in such a way that you couldn't possibly pay for what you know, put pay the price but then pretending that you could and then hoping that there's going to be more money coming along from your parents or something. Yeah, you know, no, it's, it's like inheritance. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm shocked, shocked to discover that gambling has been going on here. Yeah. Well, it's, and it's, it's absurd. They, this district received a large sum of millions of dollars in COVID federal relief funding. And this is what's a lot of these districts, instead of using it on COVID relief and uh, tutoring to help the kids catch up, spent it on giving them giving the employees pay raises. So what's happened is they've diverted the money for themselves. That's what's happened here. This should be a scandal. And that's so and, and they knew it was one time funds, yet they committed it 
committed the money to long-term collective bargaining agreements. I think on, on that basis alone, you know, those agreements are just not valid. They were not funded with, with consistent dollars from any source. <laughs> so, well, and you also brought up in terms of office spending, you know, you have, uh, you broke down a few strange things that kind of popped up to you um, on your blog. And one of them was 24 million in district wide leadership meetings, you know, including 6.2 million for equity meetings and 8 million for strategic goals. Yes. And you, you do have to wonder in, t in this day and age, it's, it's a single town. I know traffic's awful in Seattle and I hate driving across town, but you can do things on Zoom now that you couldn't before. And it, it doesn't cost $6 million or $24 million to uh, subscribe. So, you know, I'm, I'm unclear yeah. on how you justify if, if you have to close 20 elementary schools for $100 million, how you justify spending $20, uh, $30 million for those two items. You well, know? it was... Twenty-four million dollars in the leaderships of the off of the district of super uh, district of Seattle public schools has come up with policies in the leadership offices. They're spending twenty-four million dollars that are driving parents out of Seattle public schools. Okay, so you, you're not hearing uh, any noises out of that leadership office. How do we get the how do we get the parents back? And perhaps this, we should not be funding $6 million in equity and excellence, which is just cover for the DEI policies, the racist policies uh, that they're put in place in the Seattle schools. What do you think parents are going to do when they're told that their children do not deserve attention because they're the wrong color of skin? Okay. Parents are going to just pull out, pull their children out if they have the means to do so. So Perhaps a little self-reflection uh, and a, a re, you know, reset uh, in a sort of uh, mentality of how do we get the parents back to Seattle Public Schools? So, I, I uh, just think it's it's really valuable to study that uh, budget and to point where uh, uh, you know waste is it's it's terribly inefficient. There's no need with even with reduced enrollment to cut any schools in the district um, and. I'm 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 really sorry, sad to see this happen again because I tell you I've been following what happens in these public schools for a long time now since my children were little and that my son is nearly 40 years old and this is exactly the pattern that happens all the time the district comes up with some policy parents hate parents have no option they 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 have no way to send their child to a private school or a charter school. They're forced to attend this school, uh, these, these public schools that are mismanaged and misrun, and they force families to accept policies they don't like, and, and they can't do anything about it. And so that is why school choice taking off in other states is so exciting, because it changes the dynamic. It's the power dynamic that, it, that became so glaring and obvious during COVID, when parents could not get the school superintendents to reopen the schools uh, when they were safe to reopen and everybody saw the private schools were reopening that fall of 2020 and yet the public schools stayed closed that year. So this is what's happened. You know, the chickens have to come home to roost and no one is buying these lies the, from the, you know, these, uh, you know, we, we pay these administrators in the Seattle public schools, big salaries to balance the budgets and ballot balancing budgets is just a simple mathematical exercise yet. They're not doing it. So it's, it, well, it deserves a lot of attention. I hope we get it this time because it's not fair to do this to parents because imagine what they're doing. Here they are told that their local public school is going to be closed. So, oh, my, the, the school where I bought a house, uh, where my child has been attending for years, uh, is going to close. You can imagine what that does to parents. Where is my child going to go? How is my child going to get there? Is that school going to be as good as this? Is it going to be a much bigger school where my child becomes lost in the in the in the shuffle because no one knows my child? I mean, the anxiety level on it that this inflicts on parents is is astronomical and outrageous. And here, this school district claims to be inclusive and caring and collaborative with parents, yet they come down with these dictates from on high, which is obviously shows contempt for parents. No one's, he's not listening to parents. They're having these community meeting, community meetings to take input from parents. No one's being listened to. He's just, he's just announcing the directive from on high. It's, 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 I mean, really, we need a better system and it's, it's uh, bleeding our taxpayers dry. It's not delivering high quality education to our children. Too many children do not learn basic basics in reading and math and science, and we need a better system. And so that's the structural uh, 
uh, change that has to come, and it's coming. I mean, when, and it will come in Washington state's a question, but it's coming because it's happening in other states now. And even the Washington Post is writing about it. Pretty exciting, Dave. <laughs> so before we uh, switch to Spokane, I wanted to get some of the questions in about Seattle. One was that, you know, you touched on it a little bit here already, but it was that they've had a significant decline in, in enrollment. Shouldn't yes. that result in some level of school closure? That's That's question number one. Why don't we tackle that? Well, I think that the decision for education be, should be made primarily with the interest of the children in mind. And small schools are actually good for children because they don't get lost in these large, large anonymous places. So just in, in this situation, because the Seattle Public Schools is such a wealthy district because it spends $500 million in the central offices, there is no reason to close one school the, the savings, if needed, should be, as I said, should come from central office spending, from renegotiating the contracts with the union, or for, and from attracting families back into the district. That's the way to do this. And, and so in, in this case, uh, the reduced enrollment should not result in any closed schools. Next question. Is there a difference in performance of schools partially driven by the most engaged parents taking their kids out of public schools and putting them in private or charter schools? In other words, is there a correlation between parental involvement, student performance such that higher performing kids become grouped together and lower performing kids get grouped together through school choice? Well, there is research showing that similarly motivated children who get the chance to attend a charter school perform better than children who don't, do not win a lottery to attend a charter school and are stuck in their traditional public schools. So the answer is, of course, motivation matters. But if you take similarly motivated students and put them in a traditional school and, and in a, a charter school that is more flexible and independent and whose program is suited to the needs of that child, the child will do better in a charter school, okay? And then other research that takes into account the, the, these, the differences, you know, that, that controls for differences in, um, in motivation show that it's the type of school that makes the difference, not, uh, and so, so we should be giving uh, more children access to charter schools and to private schools because those schools actually meet the needs of the child better than these one size fits all standardized model uh, that treats children as interchangeable with and teachers and everyone in the system as interchangeable widgets that, that have to be forced through this factory model. And so I, I think that I think that the debate's over. All the research shows that it's good to have school choice, that school choice brings competition to officials like the, in the Seattle Public Schools so that they no longer uh, look down on their uh, parents as somebody they they treat uh, with disdain. Uh, it, it forces traditional schools to up their game and improve, to be more efficient with their dollars, and to get rid of the policies that keep the, the traditional public schools down. There's That's just a whole long list of, of them. We can go forever. But no, the answer is it's not a question of, of um, motivation. It's a question of the quality of school that the child attends. Yeah, it strikes me too. Competition, you know, there's a lot of, of, of ways where not everyone is equally competitive. Not everyone's going to price shop for everything at the local store, but enough people do so that so that they're in competition with the store down the street, you know, because there's, well, you know, they'll lose some, there's a lose enough customers to change their behavior. And then everybody benefits from the price cut that they gave to the strawberries because they're in competition with or well, whatever absolutely. it was. The detergent, yes. you know. Yeah. I'm sorry to I didn't mean to cut you off, Dave, but you know, think about this. The 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 parents in public education have been conditioned to be passive recipients of whatever crumbs they, they're given by these central districts and you and unions. They've been conditioned, okay, to not shop, to not seek out other options like you would strawberries or or insurance you know, plans, car insurance or cars or whatever. Home plans, cars, Home yeah, plans, everything. whatever. Yeah. Americans are great shoppers, but they're they're conditioned to not be shoppers in public education. So so what we what you have here is 
uh, highly educated people know that education is very important. So they do everything they can to, to, to work, to either get to private schools or to work the public education system so their child gets the very best thing. But if you start to give everyone an option, including not as educated people that are low income people, immigrants, whatever, you tell them you have the option to choose your school. Believe you me, these parents want as much, want, are just as motivated to have their child get a good education as someone who is very high highly educated because, you know, immigrants from, from Ethiopia that drive your U Uber uh, car to the airport will tell you they want their child to get a better education than the third grade education they got in Ethiopia. Everybody knows that education is, is the pathway to prosperity and success. And so, so it just, to me, that whole argument that, uh, you know, parents can't possibly choose because they don't know enough, is just bunk. And it's just, it's just another uh, example of the these uh, self-interested monopoly lies that they put out to keep everybody trapped within the public schools. Here's a question from Joanna. It appears that from the Seattle Public Schools that the largest part of the budget, 59.8% of the $1.17 billion budget, is spent on teaching activities, while only 5.8% is listed as central administration, and another 5.8% is allocated yes. to the principal's office. Well, we... thank, thank you, Joanne, for that uh, statistic. And, but that is misleading because the way they they categorize that spending. You see it's teaching activities and teaching support. If you're a, a former teacher working in the district offices, not teaching one, one child, you are categorized as teaching activities because you're a certified educator. So that I, those, so that's what I, so that's just another example of the way they, the system plays games to cover, uh, cover how much money they're actually spending on administration. I think that whole methodology is misleading. Uh, if you actually do what I did, which is look through the Seattle Public Schools current budget, and you count the number of employees in the public schools, which this budget allows you to do, and you, you compare that against the total number of employees, you will find that only two thirds of the employee of the 7,000 employees in Seattle Public Schools are actually teaching in the schools. The other third are teaching in administrative offices. And some of those people are classified as working on the activity of teaching, even though they're not. You understand what I'm saying? This is just a this is just a uh, an accounting game that they play. And so I, I think that covers that question for the most part, unless there's a follow-up, Joanna. Do we know what the overall educational performance is in states with school choice policies? Is it statistically better yes. than states without school choice? Yes, there, there's a group of people. Uh, oh gosh, I was just looking at a study recently that uh, created an education freedom index. And I wish I could remember, this is out of the University of Arkansas uh, group whose name, I'm forgetting the name of the guy, Patrick something, but it's online. You can find a study showing that uh, after the 2022 uh, announcement of the National Assessment of Educational Progress tests, which is the name, this, this organization out of the University of Arkansas created an education freedom index. I know one of the uh, uh, authors was Matthew Ladner, so you can put in his name, L-A-D-N-E-R, and it created, an, uh, these people, this group of four people, created an education freedom index uh, for all the states in the country, showing how, based on how much uh, freedom to choose schools these states have, and they did their regression analysis, their statistical analysis, and they concluded and showed that the the school, states with more freedom to choose their schools have higher performance on this NAEP test, which is considered the, na the nation's report card. So yes, you give families access to school choice and you get better outcomes for children. That is what the research shows. It stands to reason anyway. It's common sense. You, get, you put parents in the driver's seat. You give them control over where their money goes. You fund the child, not the system, and you will change the structure of public education to serve the parents and the child and not the self-interested bureaucrats and unions that now have control over the money. And again, COVID brought that out. COVID brought out what really goes on. And, uh, uh, we do the best we can to give the information, however big you can see it. I mean, what can you do? 
Here's a, a question from an anonymous attendee, and you might not know the answer to this, obviously, because it deals with a different district. They say, does this scenario ring true for other districts as well? For example, Olympia School Districts facing school shutdowns due to a levy fail. Another district within Thurston County is laying off upwards of 200 staff. For the, the devastating levy failure, that's a staffing layoff of the district consisting of only one high school. So the student impact is going to be astronomical, they say. Any comment? Well, I don't know the specifics of that situation, but I would ask this question of that district. How many of the layoffs are actually teachers and 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 how many of those layoffs are non-teachers? And why is this district firing one teacher when they have so many non-teachers on staff? It is true across the nation that only about half of the employees in the public schools are actually classroom teachers and the rest are non-teachers. So there's plenty of room to uh, accommodate a lower enrollment by reducing the number of non-teachers in these public schools. So the problem is that not every district in, in the state of Washington has as clear a budget document as the Seattle Public Schools. So you can actually count the number of people like I did in the Seattle Public Schools, actually in the Seattle Public School buildings and compare that against the total number employed in the district. So that's that's an avenue you could take. You could, you, if you're in, a, in the Olympia district, you could send a public records request and ask how many people are in the uh, are working in the schools and how many people are working in the central district. And I would venture to guess that there are about a third of the employees working in that district, working in the central offices. Why can see that? Here's a question I'll, I'll, um, I'll conglomerate a, a few uh, together. If uh, if a levy is for extras and the state pays for basic education, why do levy failures result in catastrophic layoffs? I, I, well, that is an excellent question because the, it, the, a levy failure should not result in catastrophic layoffs. It is another example of games being played here. Levy dollars, remember in the 2018 uh, McCleary uh, solution in the legislature, it was, it was declared that levy dollars only go to enhancements to basic education and the state would provide a lot more funding to to fund basic education in the schools so we had so so any district that is claiming that it is that is hurting basic education of children that is teachers uh is playing games with the public uh to put a guilt trip on taxpayers for refusing to pass the levies. And that I think is despicable. I mean, this is just a big game for more money uh, that we're seeing played out. And uh, if it, so uh, that the question, your question is excellent and it should be asked of that district because it's not one teacher should be, should be, um, you know, the state is fully funding basic education. The levies are only for enhancements to basic education. Uh, if, this, if the district can't manage it's a dramatic increase in funding. There's something wrong with the leadership there. Um, but, but instead of taking another question on that topic, I'm going to switch us to Spokane so we don't run out of time. Um, one of the things he pointed out recently was that charter schools on a, a regular basis were outperforming traditional uh, public schools, particularly in Washington State, because we had the Education Board released a new report showing that the charter schools were outperforming. All other things being equal, kids were doing better in statewide tests at these uh, charter schools. And that was kind of a vindication, well, not kind of, that was a solid vindication of the whole intent of charter schools was to innovate, create uh, new ways to best address uh, and unlock the potential of each individual child and make schools that really fit their learning styles. Um, we we talked about this for Spokane because Spokane has uh, a few charter schools in it, and you took a look at the school most applicable uh, to traditional public schools. Took a look at whether that applied also in Spokane. Why don't you just give us a summary of of what you found? Well, yes, there is a school in Spokane, which is a charter school that was opened by the Spokane Public School District. It's called the Spokane International Academy, and it goes from K through twelve. And it is providing a very high quality education to the, to the students there. And you can just look, they have about 775 students at this school. And the percentages of students 
uh, passing the state tests in math, English, and science are much higher than the uh, the, the same percentages of their peers in the, in the Spokane public schools. And so there is a case in point that if you allow children to leave the Spokane public schools to attend a charter school, that school is set up in a way to deliver better quality education for the children there. That's one school. There's two other charter schools in uh, Spokane, which are especially um, uh, compelling to me because the one of them is Pride, Pride Charter Schools that serves a very high proportion of special needs children. And that school does a great job for by by tailoring the program to meet the needs of those children. And and I visited that school. It is an excellent school for the children there. And then there is a third school that has let, let me just let me just add before you skip, we we did yeah. some interviews and, and you were a part of those interviews uh, a couple of years ago of a lot of the students there. And one of the one of the things I noted time and again were, were students were saying basically that they were they were planning on dropping out, uh, yes. but then they went to the Pride School. So uh, yes, and know, it, the, it was the that charter is school a, kept them in school. The charter exactly the charter school kept them in school instead of falling through the cracks like they do at these big anonymous high schools in the traditional system. Many children just need a little extra attention. They what they need is a mentor, an adult who uh, advocates on their behalf in the high school. Well, traditional public high schools don't aren't able and don't organize themselves to be able to provide that adult assistance to these vulnerable children. But the charter schools, they organize themselves so that they can provide that. And you talk to these children that, that graduate from charter schools and they say, oh my gosh, Mr. Smith or Miss Brown, who was assigned to me in ninth grade, she was my mentor. They call it advisor or mentor or whatever. And these adults become their, their advocate. Um, and help these these teachers or you know every child gets uh, an advisor and that advisor stays with them all the way through the high school and helps them get to school if they're not getting to school on time or whatever need they you know whatever if they have a practical need that that advisor helps them meet that but they also help them with their classes and tell them tell them classes to take and and then to help them apply to college so, so you hear you hear these incredible stories and it's all personal. It's all about the connection between the teacher and this vulnerable young child who was gonna drop out if they stayed in the traditional public schools. And so if we really cared about the children that are falling through the cracks, cracks like this, we would open more schools like Pride School in Spokane. So, and, and, and you, uh, Dave, I visited them. They, they created um, outdoor programs where these kids who don't normally get a chance to go hiking in our beautiful mountains get to go and stay and hike and and uh, camp and do what they, you know, do outdoor activities. They have programs for um, so ch teach children how to sew and knit and use machines so they can they can actually get a little trade. It's just it's it's and it, it makes everybody excited to come to school. I mean, it's a great school. So because it's focused on the child, and so I think that's an awesome school. Yeah, and then you mentioned there was one more school, and that one was um, designed specifically for uh, teen mothers in Spokane. Yes, it's called Lumen Charter School, and that was opened to help young girls who get pregnant in high school stay in high school. And you, you, you everyone knows of stories of of girls who got pregnant when they hadn't graduated from high school, and then they dropped out, and there they were set upon a life of of deprivation and poverty and sadness, right? So here we have a school that keep, that helps them take care of their infant children, but make sure that the young mother gets the lesson she needs to graduate from high school. Well, what better what better thing to do for the, this group of of uh, of students? And so, of course, that's not done in a big traditional public high school. Uh, again, an anonymous place where if you get pregnant, you get left behind. Nobody thinks twice about you. So well, and the, and the schedule is not the same. I mean, they're by, by their nature, they're kind of a one size fits all. This is our schedule. This is that. Whereas the other one, you know, they're catering specifically to the needs of the student, which makes it great because they can, they, they figure out what, what best serves these students instead of, you know, that you have a schedule and the students figure out a way to fit in. It's, it's how do we serve the students, which is a different focus, which is, um, which is tremendous there, I think. And then yes. ultimately, ultimately, your analysis showed 
you know, the, the charter school in Spokane that's most applicable to the general public school, you know, was doing better than the public school. It's not apples to apples, but it's close enough to get, you know, to, uh, to boost the findings nationally and, uh, and, and in our state uh, report that charter schools are doing better than traditional public schools. And, and it also feeds into what you talked about before, which was the structural deficit in Seattle, the lack of choice. Um, you know, if, if, if these other, if the charter school choice option is already outperforming our, our schools, and you know, keep in mind they have, you've gone through this list a million times, I know, Leaf, but um, they have the funding discrimination against them. They have illegal roadblocks about starting, charting st starter school, schools is difficult. The Seattle school is threatened with closure, would have to get a waiver in order to create a, a charter school just to start. And there's been all these attempts at stopping them even though they're outperforming the traditional school, which which tells you a lot right there. But these other options that are popping up where the parents would get, you know, the money follows the child rather than a system, um, that could open up a whole new slate of, of opportunities for students uh, with unique yeah, Yes, I mean, there's, you know, it's so interesting because we we started with a system that is standardized and aimed at the, the average child. And there's no such thing as an average child. So, and if, if you were trying to produce widgets on a factory floor, this is what you would do, but these are people we're talking about. And so it's, it, it's, it, so individualizing is the, is the proper, so what we have, the structural system we have doesn't allow teachers to individualize the program to meet the needs of children. Every time you try to reform the traditional public schools from outside, you get a, no, we can't do that because of this collective bargaining agreement. No, we can't do that because of this rule from the state. No, we can't do that. Okay, this it's just a set of rules that they must comply with the standardized model. So it it defeats the purpose of of education, really. I mean, the way that it's organized is is uh, totally backwards. It should really be from the ground up where parents, just like they used to do, parents would pay tutors, you know, individual tutors to educate their children. And back in, in Greece, under the tree, they would hire a tutor and the children would sit around and learn from one man and parents would pay for that. We need to go back to that, but it can be publicly supported with public dollars. But imagine what was going to come in the next 20, 30 years now with school choice. We're going to see this incredible uh, flirt, uh, you know, new development of, of, of exciting, creative, innovative schools that no one's ever thought of before, but will excite the imaginations of the educators within them and the, and the children uh, able to attend them. So it's it's like a brand new day in public education. Uh, and these there's going to be continuing fights with these powerful central office officials who are going to hold on to their money and the unions who want to keep their power and influence in the system. There, there will be a continuing fight. But but uh, we're going to see these exciting, like like more schools like Lumen serving serving young mothers in the schools, more schools like Pride that set are set up to serve kids with special needs. There'll be, you know, there are charter schools in New Jersey, for example, that serve just children with aut autism. They they do they they deliver the best uh, behavioral therapies to serve children with autism. So why wouldn't you want to create schools like that here in Washington state? Why wouldn't you free up and help charter schools to open to serve children with autism instead of forcing them into a system that, that doesn't serve them well? And you hear that the horror stories of public education often come from families with autistic children because they're not getting what they need. And so that's just a wrong. And so Anyway, I'm I'm really encouraged by what's happening in other states, and uh, now the now it looks like the schools in this this state, Washington State, are overreaching so badly, making such bad decisions. Maybe we'll get school choice here sooner than we think. Well, thank you, Leave. Thank you for uh, participating today and for all that information. If you have more questions for Leave, you can always reach her at WashingtonPolicy.org. Go to the education uh, uh, section there, and you'll see. Um, all of Lee's writing. Uh, some of you have had some questions. I know that some of the answers to those questions are on that site, you know, uh, but uh, Lee's contact information and email is there as well. Thanks again, Lee. Appreciate Great. it. Great. Thank you very much. You bet.